Good afternoon, everyone. This is Chair Ruth Richardson and pursuant to House Rule 10.1, I call this remote meeting of the Education Policy Committee to order. And Ellen, will you please take the roll for uh, attendance, please? Chair Richardson? Present. Vice Chair Hassan? Representative Erickson? Present. Representative Drezkowski? Present. Representative Bennett? Present. Representative Berg? Present. Uh, Representative Bo? Representative Bo? Present. Representative Christensen? Present. Representative Edelson? Present. Representative Feist? Present. Representative Frazier? Present. Representative Jordan? Present. Representative Keeler? Present. Representative Moeller? Present. Representative Mueller? Present. Representative Poston? Present. Representative Scott? Representative Erdahl? Representative Waslowick? Present. Vice Chair Hassan. Representative Scott. Representative Ertel. Madam Chair, a quorum is present. Thank you, Ellen. Today, uh, we are going to be hearing from uh, a number of speakers uh, related to the just published report from the House Select Committee on Racial uh, Justice. Uh, the report is being published today. A draft report was released um, last uh, December that really focused on the work of the uh, committee that was created as a result of House Resolution 1 last year declaring racism as a public uh, health uh, crisis. And in order to set up a opportunity for public testimony uh, next week, we're starting with uh, some of the speakers that participated through those uh, several House hearings that were held over the summer. And I will introduce our, our speakers uh, shortly, but do note that uh, next Monday's hearing is going to be a continuation of this hearing uh, where we will have the House Select Committee uh, uh, racial justice final report published and encourage members to take the time to uh, read through the report, particularly the issues uh, related to uh, education. And we'll also open up that meeting to public testimony as well. Uh, so with that, let's turn to today's uh, speakers who are going to be addressing uh, racial disparities in education. And I will ask members to please hold their uh, questions until the end. We've got uh, quite a bit of uh, information to get through, but we'll keep track of who has questions and uh, we'll, we'll loop back around to you after all of our presenters are completed. Our first presenter, of today is uh, Dr. Uh, Kamara Jones. Uh, Dr. Jones is the past president of the American Public Health Association. She is the 2019-2020 Evelyn Green uh, Dav uh, Davis Fellow um, at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. She is a adjunct professor at Harvard University um, within the uh, um, Roland School of Public Health at Emory University as well, and is a senior fellow and adjunct associate professor for Morehouse School of, of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Jones is not only a medical doctor, but also 
uh, holds a master's in public health and her doctorate um, as well. And so with that, I will turn it over to you, Dr. Jones. Uh, you should have the ability to um, share your screen and begin your presentation. Thank you so much, Representative Richardson. Thank you to the Education Policy Committee uh, for having this hearing and for inviting me to be a speaker. I'm going to share my screen. And Dr. Jones, um, yes. if you wouldn't just mind restating your name too, right before you get started. I should okay. have said that. I surely will, I surely will. So I am Dr. Kamara Phyllis Jones, MD, MPH, PhD, and hold on. Ooh, we're at the end of my talk, which is actually not what we were trying to get. We're trying to get to the beginning. And so, um, so yes, Kamara Phyllis Jones, MD, MPH, PhD, family physician, epidemiologist, past president of the American Public Health Association, and an anti racism thought leader. And so I did have the opportunity to uh, present to the Select Committee on Racial Justice. And I am going to share some of the same material tweaked a, a bit with you all today. So I've entitled my remarks, Achieving Societal Equity, which of course includes education equity, housing equity, health equity, you know, wealth equity, all of that. Achieving societal equity, naming racism and moving to action. So because I'm a family physician epidemiologist, I think I'd start you where we are, the conversation we're having about health equity, where um, I and now a number of others define health equity as assurance of the conditions for optimal health for all people. The key understanding there is that health equity is not something that we try to get to. We do try to get to certain outcomes. We do want to get attainment of the highest level of health for all people, but health, if we got there last Sunday, would we be done? No, health equity is actually a process. Which process assurance? which is actually one of the three core functions of public health uh, that were identified by the Institute of Medicine along with assessment and policy development, assurance of what of the conditions for optimal health for all people. How do we get there? Well, achieving health equity requires valuing all individuals and populations equally, recognizing and rectifying historical injustices and providing resources according to need. And how is health equity related to health disparities? Well, health disparities will be eliminated when health equity is achieved. Health disparities are differences in outcomes, just like when we look at education, the so-called achievement gap or the like. Health equity or educational equity, that's all the stuff that comes before. So I started with this definition of health equity because when we move from that to societal equity, all we have to do is actually change some words and add a little phrase. Societal equity is assurance of the conditions for optimal health and well-being for all people. And achieving societal equity requires those three principles that achieving health equity requires, valuing all individuals and populations equally, recognizing and rectifying historical injustices and providing resources according to need, where societal disparities, educational disparities, housing disparities and the like will be eliminated when societal equity is achieved. So that was all as a background to say that as a family physician, epidemiologist, uh, I wish I had time to go deeply into how I got this, but as the president of the American Public Health Association, Four years ago, I launched our association on a national campaign against racism because racism is one of those systems of structured inequity that actually is foundational in our nation's history and continues to exist and have profoundly negative impacts on the health and well being of the nation. But so many of us are in denial of its continued existence or impacts at all. So, this national campaign against racism that I launched our American Public Health Association on and as many other partners as would join us actually has three tasks. The first is to name racism, to say the whole word, because if we don't, even if we're talking about cultural competence, structural competence, disparities, equity, inclusion, diversity, all of those things, race 
if we never say the word racism in our national context of widespread denial, then we are complicit with that denial. But we must go beyond naming racism to moving to action. How do we move to action? We need to ask the question, how is racism operating here? In my child school, in our state schools? How is it operating in my workplace across the nation? How is it operating in terms of police killings of unarmed black and brown men and women? How is it operating in so many ways to identify lovers for intervention, targets for action? And then once we identify those, we need to organize and strategize to act, each one in our own wheelhouse with the tools that we have, but in a coordinated way. So this is the framing. This is the framing right now. And I will say that out of that national campaign against racism that I launched APHA on in 2016, through Milwaukee County and the um, efforts of people in the Wisconsin Public Health Association, uh, including Lillianne Payne in particular, uh, and Milwaukee uh, County being the first county to make a formal declaration in May of 2019 that racism was a public health crisis. As of December 20th, a, a month ago, it's the last time I looked, there were 161 jurisdictions, counties, cities, five states that had at those levels declared racism to be a public health crisis. Minnesota, amen. There you are, big caps, because at the state level, there was such a declaration. But as I said, we have to go beyond naming racism because that is the first part that's putting the stake in the sand, saying we as public entities recognize that racism exists and hold us accountable public for making action on trying to dismantle the systems of racism and, and its detrimental impacts. But we have to move to action. So when I talk about racism with any group, now I distill four key messages. The first is that racism exists. This, I'm going to give us tools in the, in the little 25 minutes I might have left right now. I'm going to give us tools to address all of these messages, to feel confident in understanding these messages and in communicating them to others and in acting on them. So the first is that racism exists. The second is that racism is a system. The third key message is that racism saps the strength of the whole society. And the fourth key message is that we can act to dismantle racism. And I would go further and say, we must act to dismantle racism if we want to make our, our society as vibrant and as strong as it could be. So the first tool I'm going to give you is one to help all of us understand and um, be able to communicate to others that racism exists. So I'm gonna give you a heads up. I do a lot of communication through allegory, this allegory that I call dual reality, a restaurant saga is like most of them based on something that I saw with my own real eyes. I hope that as I tell you this story, uh, you will remember enough of it that you can share it with somebody in your family this evening or another colleague or you know, even find it online and, and tweet it out. Anyway, so this was based on my own real life experience as a medical student. So let me set this up for you. Here I was, a first year medical student, very diligent, very studious. So on the Saturday morning, I woke up and what did I do? I hit the books and hit them hard. I was nose in the book studying and it got to be about mid afternoon when some friends came over. And did they distract me from my studies? Oh no, we all got to studying long and hard. So now it's getting late and we're all getting hungry. And I had no food in the apartment, which was quite typical of me. So my friends understood. They were like, never mind, Kamara, but we are hungry. Let's go into town and find something to eat. So we did. We went into town and we find a restaurant and we walk in and we sit down. The menus are presented. We order our food. The food is served. Here we are eating. Not a very illuminating story about racism, not where you thought I was going, not yet. But as I sat there with my friends eating, I looked across the room and I noticed a sign and that sign was a startling revelation to me about racism. So now you are wondering, Dr. Jones, what did the sign say? Well, what did the sign say? The sign said open. So now maybe I've lost most of you. Okay, so let me recap. Here we are 
sitting in a restaurant eating. I look across the room, I see a sign that says open, thinking nothing more about it. I would have assumed that other people could walk in, sit down, order their food and eat. But because of the hour, the restaurant was in fact now closed due to the hour, but so firmly closed that other hungry people just a few feet away from me, but on the other side of that sign would not be able to come and sit down, order their food and eat. And that's when I understood that racism structures open closed signs in our society, that racism structures a dual reality. And for those who are sitting inside the restaurant at the table of opportunity eating and they look up and they see a sign that says open, they don't even recognize that there's a two-sided sign going on because it is difficult for any of us to recognize a system of inequity that privileges us. So for example, it's difficult for men to recognize male privilege and sexism. It's difficult for white Americans to recognize white privilege and racism. It's difficult for all Americans to recognize our American privilege in the global context. But those on the outside are very well aware that there's a two-sided sign going on. And I'm so sorry, I know I have to, let me just move this thing out of the way because you can't see some of my words. Okay, there you go now. But those on the outside are very well aware that there's a two-sided sign going on because it proclaims clothes to them, but they can look through the window and see people inside eating. So back inside the restaurant to those who ask, is there really a two-sided sign? Does racism really exist? I say, I know it's hard for you to know when you only see open. In fact, that's part of your privilege, not to have to know. But once you do know, you can choose to act. So it's not a scary thing to name racism. It's actually an empowering thing. It doesn't even compel you to act, but it does equip you to act so that if you care about those on the other side of the sign, which is an if, but if you do, why well, you could even talk to the restaurant owner who is after all inside with you. And you could say, restaurant owner, there are hungry people outside. Why don't you open the door, let them come in? you'll make more money in all the conversations we could have. Or maybe what you'll do is try to pass food through the window. Or maybe you'll try to tear down that sign or break through the door. But at least what you won't be doing is sitting back saying, huh, wonder why those people don't just come on in and sit down and eat. Because you'll understand something about the two-sided nature of that sign. So I tell this story when I just have four or five minutes with a group to convey that yes, racism exists, even if your whole life experience has screamed open, right? And it's not just the sign, of course, it's the sign, it's the door, it's the lock, it's the whole system. I am actually heartened that many people who were born inside the restaurant, because some, you know, I once started a three hour conversation with a question with a group in Flint, Michigan. What, how could people? who are born inside the restaurant know something about the two-sided nature of that sign. It was a three hour conversation because there are many ways to know. We're not gonna go there now unless maybe you have questions about that later. But there are more people inside the restaurant now who got a little sense that there's a two-sided sign going on. It really happened starting with the COVID-19 pandemic and the disproportionate impact on communities of color and then with the very public murder of Mr. George Floyd, right? So, there are more people who understand there's a two-sided sign going on. There are more people who are putting together the word systemic racism or structural racism. There are more people who are affirming that black lives matter. This is important. You know, before they say, oh, don't those people know that all lives matter? Yes, but black lives matter. Black lives matter too, in particular, we have to hold that up. We have to affirm that into being. My fear right now is that because racism denial is so seductive in our society that if all we do is name racism, say those words, then we might be lulled back in a few months into what I describe as the somnolence, the sleepiness of racism denial. We must move into action because if we're acting, then we won't forget why we're acting. If we just say a thing, we might forget why we said that. But if we're busy tearing down the door or dismantling the lock or taking, you know, taking the sign off, all of that, we won't forget why we do that. So we must, um, I'm encouraged, but we must move to action. Right about now, I know I need to define racism for you all. I've been saying the words a lot. I told you that's what my work is on these days. 
And when I say the word racism, first of all, I'm clear that I'm talking about a system, right? I am never trying to divide the room into who's racist and who's not, or peer deeply into anybody's soul to say exactly how racist are you. No. When I say the word racism, I'm talking about a system, not an individual character flaw, not a personal moral failing, not even a psychiatric illness as some people have suggested, even though racism can manifest in those ways, but it's a system of power and a system of doing what? It's a system of doing two things, of structuring opportunity and assigning value. And on what basis is the opportunity structured and on what basis is the value assigned? It's based on so-called race, based on the social interpretation of how one looks in a race conscious society. And this, this system, hold on, sorry, I'm, I know you hear my ding, so let me just, let me um, stop this here. Um, and what, does, what are the impacts of this system? Well, when we do think about racism or talk about racism at all, we understand that it unfairly disadvantages some individuals and communities. But it shouldn't take us long to recognize that every unfair disadvantage has its reciprocal unfair advantage so that racism is also unfairly advantaging other individuals and communities. That's the whole issue of unearned white privilege that we hardly ever talk about in this country because it makes some people, especially some people who are living as white, uncomfortable. And I used to apologize when I would get to this part of my definition and say, well, you know, maybe I even made you uncomfortable. I'm, you know, I, I don't want to make anybody uncomfortable. I want to invite everybody into this conversation. But I used to apologize and say, well, just shake it off. I don't say that anymore. I say, if you feel uncomfortable thinking about or understanding or acknowledging unearned white privilege, I actually encourage you to lean into that discomfort because I have come to recognize that for all of us, the edge of our comfort is actually our growing edge. But there's a third impact of racism that many of us miss, and that is that racism is sapping the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. It's not just that Black lives matter, for example, it's that Black lives are genius, their you know, they're leadership, their creativity, their generosity and love. And when we constrain, and you guys know in terms of educational policy, when we constrain Black lives and Latinx lives and indigenous lives and Asian Pacific Islander lives and native Hawaiian you know, lives and all of these racialized lives, when we constrain those lives slowly by not vigorously investing in the full, excellent public education of all of our children because the blinders of racism have made some people think there's no genius in the barrios or the ghettos or on the reservations. We can get along very well, thank you, without those kids. Of course, we, know, we have to recognize there's genius in all of our communities. And if we were only to fully and vigorously invest in that genius, we could be doing so much better as a nation or even as a world. I don't want to stay on this point long. I could stay in any of my points, you know, 10 minutes on, on any given thing. And I know I just have a little bit of time, but I do want to say that I've hit now the second and third of the key messages. The first key message was that racism exists. The second is that racism is a system. The third is that racism saps the strength of the whole society through the waste of human resources. And I think even more evident to us these days is that through dividing people one from another and even dividing some people from their own interests. Um, so the fourth point is that we can act to dismantle racism, and in fact, we must. And so I want to just quickly share with you another framework and some my allegory, my gardener's tale allegory, to help us understand how does racism get into the body? How does it, racism get into the schools? You know, how does racism get into our housing? How does racism turn into these differential societal outcomes that we see? And so I, 20 years ago, 21 years ago now, published uh, a paper in the American Journal of Epidemiology where I talked about three levels of racism, institutionalized, which I now would call structural, personally mediated, which some people call interpersonal, but I am so clear that racism is a system. This is the system mediated through people. So that's why I call it personally mediated and internalized. So I'm gonna very quickly define these levels of racism for you, how they can impact health or education and the like. I'm just gonna really hit them very lightly, but I need to tell you the story that can help us all understand uh, where we should go from here. 
So institutionalized or structural racism is the system, if you will, it's the structures, policies, practices, norms, and values that taken together result in differential access to the goods, services, and opportunities of society by race. This is the kind of racism that's been in, institutionalized in our norms and you know, laws and policies and the like, and it doesn't require an identifiable perpetrator. It shows up often as inherited disadvantage or as reciprocal inherited advantage. We see it in terms of material conditions and in terms of access to power. So often when I'm talking about health, I say, you know, look at, at examples in terms of differential access to quality housing or excellent educational opportunities or equal employment opportunities or even the same level of income at the same, same level of employment. And I usually talk about those things impacting health. Well, we can go all around and mix it all up because all of these things impact edu education and the like, health impacts education, housing. And these are all one big knot, right? These are the so-called social determinants of health, right? But so on and on, medical facilities, educational facilities, all of these things, this is how we see institutionalized racism or structural racism. We even see it in terms of access to power, power as information. Information about our full histories, right? This is very much about curriculum and the like for people to know their full histories. That's power, you know. If, if, you know, access to power as resources, not just capital resources, but social networking resources. Power as voice in government, media, and the like. And I'm so happy to be speaking to you all in state government. This is a real privilege. So I really look forward to your questions to me. Um, sometimes on the health side of things, people have challenged me and said, well, housing, education, employment, income, isn't that what we call social class? So why do you have that on a slide about racism? Are you talking about racism or are you really talking about social class? Such an important question. I usually go into a lot of depth about this, but the short response is that it doesn't just so happen that some folks, that communities of color in most parts of the United States are overrepresented in poverty while white folks are overrepresented in wealth. It's not just a happenstance. And there are historical injustices, initial historical injustices that set it up their contemporary structural factors that are perpetuating those initial historical injustices. Initial histor historical injustices, including the taking for American Indians or Alaska Natives, the taking of the land and the near genocide and moving people to reservations, reserved lands. For people of African descent, it includes the kidnapping of West African people, our importation across the Atlantic with tremendous loss of life. And then for centuries for the survivors and their progeny going forward, centuries of usury of our unpaid labor to build this country. I usually go into a lot of depth. I just have to say that all of these things are perpetuated, the initial historical injustices are perpetuated by present day contemporary structural factors, which are part and parcel of institutionalized or structural racism. For example, how we fund public schools in most part of this country based on local property taxes, which means if you have a poor community, you can have poorly funded schools, most often poor educational outcomes and another generation lost or another generation with these frontline essential jobs pushed into the fray, even in terms of the COVID-19 that we're seeing right now. So when people ask me, am I talking about social class or racism? I say that institutionalized or structural racism explains why we see an association between social class and race in this country at all. I also need to say that structural racism can be through acts of doing, as well as acts of not doing, acts of commission, as well as acts of omission. And very often we see structural racism as lack of action, inaction in the face of need. The second level of racism I describe as personally mediated racism, I define as differential assumptions about the abilities, motives, and intents of others by race and then differential actions. Based on those assumptions, this is what most people think of when they hear the word racism. Somebody did something to somebody. It includes the different idea, the prejudice, and the different action, the discrimination. Many ways that this can manifest, including teacher devaluation, teacher looking at a young child and thinking that child can't learn and putting them off in the attention deficit disorder track where that child will never even know their full potential, much less have the opportunity opportunity to develop to their full potential. Like structural racism, this level can be through acts of doing as well as acts of not doing. But even more important at this level is to recognize that personally mediated racism can be unintentional as well as intentional. That is, you do not have to have intended to do something racist to have had a racist impact. 
The third level of racism, internalized racism, I'm defining here from point of view of members of stigmatized races as acceptance by members of stigmatized races of negative messages about our own abilities and intrinsic worth. Sorry. Um, hold on for, for just a sec. Um, and so um, this manifests as self-devaluation, people of color feeling maybe I'm really not as good as, maybe I shouldn't try to graduate from high school, maybe I shouldn't try to get that job, live in that neighborhood. Um, and it turns into the white man's ISIS Calder syndrome, uh, which is a phrase that I heard from my parents and their generation and what it meant back then for people of color, it still means for many of us today. And that is, say I'm black and I need a doctor, I might actually seek out a white doctor over a black doctor, or I might, if I needed a lawyer, seek out a white lawyer over a black lawyer, or if my water were cold, were warm and I needed ice, I might go way down the street to get the white man's ice over the black man's ice, deeply believing that the white man's ice is colder, deeply internalizing the myth of white superiority. And it shows up as resignation and helplessness and hopelessness, which turns into a lot of self-destructive health behaviors. It's about members of stigmatized races accepting the limitations to our own full humanity of the box into which we've been placed. So that when we hear young high school students of color and one of them's trying to be the valedictorian and the friends are teasing her or him by saying, oh, you know, so-and-so, she's, she's just trying to be white. We need to challenge that because since when did white people claim exclusive access to excellence? They did not. So I would like to, I, I know that I was trying to be within half an hour, I can stay, Representative Richardson, how much more time can I have to tell the story and then just share a few more ideas? Um, you can go for another five or six minutes, that'll be fine. Okay, okay. thank you so much. This is going to be my Gardner's Tale allegory. I actually am going to stop sharing my screen so that you can see me big because I'm going to use my, um, my hands a lot. This story was based on something that happened to my, in my own real life, but I'm gonna to jump to the essence of the story. Let's just say that in my own real life, I saw that, that the, the quality of the soil matters, right? When you're planting plants, the quality of the soil matters. So now I'm gonna start with an image of a gardener who has two flower boxes, one which she knows to have rich fertile soil and one which she knows to have poor rocky soil. And she has seed for the same kind of flowers, except that some of the seed is going to produce pink blossoms and some of the seed is going to produce red blossoms. And this gardener prefers red over pink. So what does she do? She takes the red seed and puts it in the rich fertile soil, the pink seed in the poor rocky soil. And three weeks later, she sees what I actually had seen in my own garden, but I hadn't done it on purpose. She sees that in the rich fertile soil, all the red seed has sprouted. And the strong red seed has grown very tall and vigorous, but even the weak red seed makes it halfway up. But in that poor rocky soil, the weak pink seed planted in that poor rocky soil dies, but even the strong pink seed in the poor rocky soil has to struggle to make it to a middling height. And then in those two flower boxes, those flowers go to seed, right? And the next year, the same thing happens. And then those flowers go to seed. And year after year after year after year, the same thing happens until finally about 10 years later, the gardener is looking at her flower boxes and she says, you know, I was right to prefer red over pink. So I hope I said that she preferred red over pink in the beginning. It's been a long time, I, you know, I, when I get in the middle, okay. She says, I was right to prefer red over pink. So let's stop the story right there to say the first part of the story is how structural or institutionalized racism works. Where you have the initial historical injustice of the separation of the seed into the two types of soil. You had the contemporary structural factors of the flower boxes, keeping the soil separate. And then through lack of action, inaction in the face of need, perpetuation of the inequity. But let's pick the story back up to say, well, where would personally mediated racism be in this garden? Well, the gardener's looking over at red thinking, oh, red is so beautiful. And then she looks at the pink flowers and she says, oh, those pink flowers sure are scrawny and scraggly. So she plucks off the pink blossoms before they can even go to seed. Or maybe she notices that a pink seed has blown into the rich fertile soil. So she plucks it out before it can establish itself, which is some of the anti-affirmative action stuff that goes on. And where would internalized racism be in the garden? Well, the red flowers are just living their lives, enjoying being red. You know, many of them not acknowledging or perhaps not even recognizing that they're benefiting from enriched soil. 
Pink Flower is looking over at Red, thinking Red is mighty fine and wishing with all their hearts that they too could be Red. And here come the bees minding their own business, collecting nectar, but pollinating at the same time. So here comes a bee bzz, into one of the pink flowers and then bzz, to another pink flower and bzz, to this pink flower. And that flower's like, get away from me, bee. Don't bring me any of that pink pollen. I prefer the red because the pink flower has internalized that red is better than pink. So now the question arises, what do we do to set things right in this garden? Well, we could start out by addressing the internalized racism. We can go over to the pink flowers and say, pink is beautiful, power to the pink. That is an important intervention, but if that's all we do, it's not gonna change the situation in which the pink flowers find themselves. So you might say, okay, okay, well, let's address the personally mediated racism. Let's have a conversation with the gardener or better yet, let's have a workplace multicultural workshop for the gardener, right? So, and so we do all that. And we say, dear gardener, would you please stop plucking those pink flowers? And maybe she will, and maybe she won't. But even if she does, it's not gonna change the situation in which the pink flowers find themselves. If we really want to set things right in this garden, we must address the structural racism, which means we have to either break down the boxes and mix up the soil, or if we wanna keep separate boxes, that's all right too, although it makes it easier for that same gardener to keep segregating resources going forward. But if we wanna keep separate boxes, it means we have to enrich the poor rocky soil until it is as rich as the rich fertile soil. And when we do that, the pink flowers will flourish. They'll be looking beautiful, grand and glorious. So that in the intervention on the structural racism, we will have also addressed the internalized racism because pink will no longer be looking over at red, thinking that red is better or wanting to be red. And in the intervention on the structural, we may also address the personally mediated racism. Now, the original gardener may have to go to her grave, preferring red over pink, but her children who grow up and see the flowers equally beautiful will be less likely to have that same kind of attitude. So this story has been to illustrate those three levels of racism and to strongly suggest that if we want to set things right in the garden, we need to at least address the structural racism. Good to address all the levels at the same time, but at least address the structural. And when we do, the other levels may take care of themselves. I hope I did uh, just Justice to the story, shortening it so much. But anyway, I hope you understood. But here's an important question we haven't asked, which is, who is the gardener? Because after all, the gardener is the one that I gave the power to decide, the power to act, and control of resources, which are actually the elements of self-determination. You know, who's the gardener? Well, government's a huge part of the gardener. Here you guys are, but not all. You know, so you know there are other parts like you know uh, companies or media. You know communities to the extent they have self-determination, but whoever the gardener is, it is dangerous when the gardener is not allied with one group. I painted her red, that's why she preferred red over pink. And it's also dangerous when she's not concerned with equity, when she can look at her flower boxes and think, you know, that her garden is beautiful because she's not even counting the pink flowers as part of her garden. So our challenge now is what do we do about the gardener? Do we make the gardener polka dotted? or striped or fuchsia, do the pink flowers have to grow, recruit their own gardener? Lots of questions can come out of this and I hope that we would have time to that. I just want to go quickly uh, through the last slides. I just want to say that be, I've given you tools for naming racism, two allegories in fact, but we have to go to that next step, which is asking how is racism operating here? Looking at our structures, policies, practices, norms and values, which are the elements of decision-making. Structures are the who, what, when and where of decision-making especially who's at the table and who's not, what's on the agenda and what's not. Bravo to you all for putting anti-racism on your agenda right now. And if structures are the who, what, when, and where of racism, policies are the written how, practices and norms are the unwritten how, and values are the why. I need to say that there are, I've identified seven kind of values based uh, things. I now call them social delusions that are barriers to our achieving health equity. So I'm just gonna hit them a little bit. Our narrow focus on the individual makes systems and structures either invisible or irrelevant. The fact that we are ahistorical and act as if the present were disconnected from the past and as if the current distribution of advantage and disadvantage were happenstance is also a barrier to achieving health equity. The myth of meritocracy, the story that goes something like this, if you work hard, you'll make it. I give you most people who have made it have worked hard, but there are many, many other people working just as hard or harder who will never make it because of an uneven playing field that's been structured and perpetuated by racism and sexism and heterosexism and all of these other systems of structure inequity. And when we deny racism, then we're, in, we're buying into the myth of meritocracy. We're blaming people for their lack of success by saying they're lazy or stupid. And there are many ways to deny racism. As I said at the beginning, one way to deny racism 
is to never say the word racism. Because if you never say the word racism in the context of widespread racism denial, we're complicit. There's this myth of a zero sum game. If gain, I lose. It's almost like you're sitting at a potluck dinner and you, you know, I'm here and I don't want you to come over and eat because I think you're going to eat all the food up. I don't recognize you're bringing all kinds of cakes and pies and salads and fruits and delicious things with you. I don't even value you. There's our limited future orientation, which must really burn at you all who are in the education policy committee, because in this nation, we actually have a disregard for the children, which is one part of the future we can touch today, and a usurious relationship with the planet, which is another part of the future that we can touch today. We do not recognize that it's not my children versus your children, that all children are our children. I wish I could go into more detail on these things. I don't have the time. The sixth of these seven uh, barriers is our myth of American exceptionalism, that we're so special, so ordained by God, so unique, that there's nothing we can learn from other nations. And the seventh is white supremacist ideology, which I do not say as a lightning rod term. I say it as a simple description of the false idea of a hierarchy of human valuation by race with the false notion that even if such a hierarchy existed that would put white people at the top as the ideal or the norm, but this false idea, which is strongly held by many in this country, it permeates so much of our media and so much of our everything, so much of, I would have to say what happened on January 6th in terms of even the police response, but that gives people who are living as white a sense of entitlement. It results in the dehumanization of people of color and the fear at the browning of America that's underlying a lot of our political divide today. So what can we do today? First of all, we need to look for evidence of two-sided science. Is there something differential going on in our educational system, in our outcomes and all, by race, by language, by immigration status, by zip code, by urban, rural? Look shine the bright light of inquiry. We need to burst through our bubbles of experience to experience our common humanity. We're all in bubbles. Some are big, some are little, some have thin soap bubble boundaries, some have thick, but whatever kind of bubble you're living in, you know, me, all of us are living in, we often do not know that just across town, there are people who are just as kind, funny, generous, hardworking, and smart as we are, who are living in very different circumstances. We need to create opportunities within our educational systems and within our own lives for people to burst through their bubbles, to experience our common human humanity in different settings, because that, in that way we can build common cause. We need to be interested in the stories of others and then believe the stories of others and then join in the stories of others. We need to develop a sensitivity to seeing the absence of who is not at the table, what is not on the agenda. We need to reveal inaction in the face of need because that is how structural racism most often manifests today. But all the power is not just on those who are inside the restaurant because those of us on the outside need to know our power. We need to recognize that action is power and particularly that collective action is power. So I'm so sorry that I went over time, but I'm so delighted to have this opportunity to share these thoughts. I hope they have stimulated some ideas uh, or at least questions in your mind. So thank you very much. Dr. Jones, thank you for your very powerful testimony and also for being willing to uh, stay with us for the rest of the committee as well. And so we'll get to those uh, uh, those questions here shortly. Next up, we have uh, Dr. Uh, Johnson. Uh, Dr. Johnson um, is a, uh, a, a frequent uh, testifier with uh, the Minnesota legislature. She's the assistant professor for educational uh, leadership um, with uh, Minnesota State University. She's the former superintendent of Minneapolis uh, of Public Schools and is also the board chair for Minnesota Education and Equity Partnership. I am very grateful, Dr. Johnson, that you are here with us uh, today and we'll turn over uh, testimony to you. Uh, please introduce yourself for the record. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me. And I wanna thank Dr. Jones for her very engaging presentation. And I want to tell all of you who are present today to make sure that you think about her presentation when you hear mine. So you, when you, in education, we talk about prior knowledge a lot. So I want to thank Representative Richardson and the committee for inviting me to come and share my experiences as the superintendent of Minneapolis, the former superintendent of Minneapolis Public Schools. I'm now an assistant professor at Minnesota State University, as she said, as well as a new board chair of the Manit uh, Manit board, and I'm so excited to be here. I always thought I would have quote that sometimes I hesitate to use because 
some people don't, you know, appreciate and respect the work that John Dewey did, but I just like this quote that I changed myself. I took some liberty, but the best and wisest parent wants for his or her child, that must be what the community wants for all its children. Anything else is less than ideal and fails democracy. So I say, so goes the public schools of Minnesota, so goes the state of Minnesota. So to me, it's really important. So I'm gonna get my PowerPoint in here and start sharing with you. Oh gosh, it's always my fear here. There we go, there we go, great. So I, I'm gonna think of a better title for this, but I call it the Discipline and Suspension Dilemma. And like Dr. Jones, I've presented before on this topic. Some of the slides will be repetitive and some of them will be new because the information really hasn't changed quite frankly. So let's start with the presentation. Um, I listed my information there. I also was former deputy superintendent of Memphis City Schools. So I wanna start out with the overall population. This is a, a data slide because I'm sure the census is gonna come out with new information. But looking at the population by age and race in the state of Minnesota. And as you can see, uh, and what you know about our changing demographics, the red will start to shrink a little bit more to the left and the green will start to grow more. So th the context of who we are is really important to this presentation. So I'm gonna start out with this particular slide. In preschool and in school, kindergarten school, students are taught to recognize patterns in language. And this one is brown bear, brown bear, what do you see? So I want you to take a moment and write on a piece of paper, what do you observe what do you see in the picture on the left? Just write down what do you see in that picture on the left? I'm gonna move quickly because I'm gonna get through this. And I have polar bear, polar bear, what do you hear? And look at this particular student. Uh, and what's your description of this visual? I'm gonna keep going on to just share, get through this briefly and you will have a copy of the PowerPoint to look at. I bring these two up as an example and you can look at what you wrote. Uh, look at the, the, I'm specifically looking at these two individuals and again at this one. I won't give you, so let's start out with which is true. And I've given you the answer already. So read those statements. Students who didn't miss are more likely to drop out of school. And one suspension doubles uh, a student's risk of dropping out of school. And what that means is when kids drop out of school, let's think about what happens. They may end up engaging in risky behaviors they may end up not being able to get gainfully employed. So they're not gonna be able to contribute to the community like we would like to see them do that. And so the important thing about suspension is that they remove BIPOC youth from the learning environment. If you're not in school, you can't learn. And I'm not to say, in fact, I've known students who attend school 95% of the time and still fail. That is a different travesty. So to make up by race, students, so black students make up 11% of the students, yet they make up 41% of the expulsions and suspensions by race. So I'm trying to present you what the problem is here and then we'll talk about some things we can do. On the national average, black youth are 3.5 times more likely to suspend or expel than their white peers. In, in Minnesota, black youth are how many times more likely to be dismissed than their white peers? And if you answered, eight, you're right. Um, and then on the national level, average, native youth, five times more likely in Minnesota, as you can probably imagine, D, 10 times more likely. So students with disabilities, so this is not a, a dilemma or issue just for students of color, but also students with disability who are sometimes also the majority of students of color. So 83% of the education, I mean, uh, sorry, 17% of the students with disability make up almost 50% of the expulsions and suspensions for that group. And again, here's some more data. Student discipline disparity among students with disabilities. Sorry, I do that all the time. So incident by type, general education, special education, then the total. So you can see the differences there are really stark. So commonalities that I found uh, for students, we look at the root causes of these outcomes. I have to tell you that 
when I looked at data as a superintendent of Minneapolis for every indicator of failure, uh, black, brown, and indigenous students are at the very top. And for success factors, they're at the very bottom. And so some commonalities I found there in the high, they're the highest poverty, and there's there's a uh, lowest performing schools, most probationary teachers, and predominantly white teachers. Students of color and teachers of color. So this is the United States. You look at the data here, Minnesota, and look at the Twin Cities, which represent Minneapolis and St. Paul. So if you're a white student, you were being naughty, you were called precocious, bright, and someone who's inquisitive. If you're a black child, it was like, you're a thug, you're just not meant to be in schools. And why do we have to always assimilate and help black people assimilate to, to this culture? Why can't they figure out how to assimilate to the white culture? And if you go deep around this, that they already determined what students' futures would be. So I'm gonna give up the gig here. Uh, it really is, uh, so one of the things that I did as superintendent when I saw these disparities and discrepancies and the overall achievement gap in Minneapolis public schools, I decided to put a moratorium on suspending preschools through second grade. And that was very cautious of me, to be honest. I started at a younger grade because who would disagree with suspending and expelling a five-year-old, right? I mean, seriously, I mean, it's just, it was just insidious. So I've shared this. This is one of my favorite stories that I remembered from when I was superintendent. I uh, required my academic team, which I sat on, every month to look at all the suspensions across the district. And then after I started doing it, I was like, why did I do this? I had to remind myself because it's important. First of all, it's important for leaders to be present. It's important for leaders to show what's critical and important to do. And so I sat with my academic team and we spent time going through every suspension for all the schools we had pre-K through 12 and looked at every description. And we looked at the description of the, of the suspension. We looked at who was suspended. We looked at how they were classified by race, uh, gender. We looked at EL. Uh, we looked at special ed, GT, whatever the classifications they had assigned to them. And we, we read the descriptions and it was just really disturbing what we realized. So this little girl, a kindergarten student, was putting on lipstick in the classroom. And the teacher asked her to put it away. Well, she did and she was still playing with it. And it was distracting the student. And the teacher thought it was distracting everybody else. So the teacher went over and snatched. I'm from Alabama, so I use the word snatch when you go and grab something from somebody. And the little girl was so upset, she, 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 pushed, she pushed the chair back, the chair fell over, she ran out of the room. Well, needless to say, the little girl was suspended for being unsafe, for creating an environment of unsafety. And I just couldn't believe it. And then, so we had to also start to tackle these three Ds, I call them, defiance, disrespect, and disobedience uh, to justify the exclusion of African-American kids. Um, so this is a really, uh, really got me going. She was suspended for three days for that because she was unsafe. And we, if we don't look at the antecedent behavior, the behavior that pushes students to react in these ways, and we ignore that, we don't look at their behavior, but not what is the thing that happens prior to the behavior happening. So the consequence falls on the student. So here's, I'm gonna say, the same school, same behavior, different race, different outcomes. So I'm gonna give an example, a lot of examples here of a white student who was in the student government he got angry and frustrated one day and he kicked in the door, put a hole in the door and his behavior was written up. So he was referred for his behavior, but received no disciplinary consequences for his actions. When pressed, staff explained that Tony's parents were divorcing, that he was having a hard time, he needed extra support. And, and I'm just like, really? I mean, and I like Tony, I knew Tony, and I'm just like, I get it. But in the other hand, we had a student in the same school who knocked something over in anger, pushed it off, and the child was suspended for three days. Tony got a chance to make restitution. His mom paid for the door to get fixed. That was not offered to the other kid. He was just suspended because, you know, like I said, same school, same behavior, different race, different outcomes. So here. So the important thing about suspension is that they remove uh, black, brown, indigenous students 
from the learning environment. And there's a significant body of research illustrating the correlation between exclusionary discipline practices and increased likelihood of not graduating from high school and involvement with the criminal justice system, and, and as well as overall lower academic uh, performance. There's also research that uh, indicates that removing students from the classroom, early, early childhood puts student future success in school at risk. So can you imagine a little preschool student being suspended? What are you gonna start to think about school? You'll think that school is not the place for you. That's not a place where you're welcome and you will be supported. I'm here today as an African-American female leader, as well as a mother and a grandmother. So. The picture that I had you look up earlier, here's the same little boy. It's my grandson, Bennett, and he just turned three. He's four now, but he was three at the time. And yeah, look at that. He's a little precocious. And over here, this is my son and my grandson. He was 33 and my grandson is three. And they were taking a picture for his three-year-old pictures. Now, here's what I know about this. See how cute he looks? And yes, you agree with me. He's cute now and he's precocious and he's really smart. But I, what I know about him, as he gets older, he will be seen as a black man and a threat. The older he gets, that will be one of the things that people will see in him. So let's talk about some alternatives to suspensions. There are alternatives and the strategies that work. And like I said, I'm not spending a lot of time, I'm zipping through this. I have uh, taken uh, Dr. Ken Peterson's uh, so yes, I borrow a lot of people's work and Dr. Jones, I will be borrowing yours, uh, but uh, and give credit for it. Well, but I changed it up a little bit and I put culture with each strategy for lunch. If you don't have the best culture in your school, a cultural respect, if you don't have um, behavior policy changes that make a difference, engaging and appropriate instruction, restorative practice and interventions in place, these are all the things you can do but I'm gonna tell you, I've seen a lot of students who've been, uh, who acted out to get out of reading because they don't read well and they've been called on to read out loud. And how embarrassing could that be for you as a child? So the important thing about suspension, they, have, they paved the path to the prison pipeline. We all know how important reading is to making sure that students um, don't feed the prison to school, the school to prison pipeline. So I wanna show you some data, reading proficiency. Again, here, I know that, um, that you all have worked on looking at reading and I know we're looking now at uh, dyslexia, which is really important. So you can see what the reading results are. And I know we didn't do the MCAs uh, last year, but this is the data that we have. And uh, we know that, uh, as I said, is a, is a pipe way to prison. So math proficiency. Now, the thing about math proficiency is that what I know, because as a superintendent, I was trying to figure out everything I could to try to change the trajectory or outcomes for, for our, all of our students, quite frankly, but especially our vulnerable students, our black, brown, indigenous students. It was really important to me. So I decided to go about looking at a couple of things. One is who was teaching the students? And I found out that several administrations before that because there were shortest of math teachers, we, al we were allowed to create what was called the math endorsement. So people who were interested in teaching math, especially in middle school and high school, had an endorsement, but they didn't have the actual, most of the content that they needed. You can't teach what you don't know very well. And I also went as far as to have my research department look at, if you're, if you're late, if you're absent, I'm sorry, if you're absent eight days from school, which means you have 95% attendance, it has more of an adverse impact on math proficiency than on reading proficiency. And so imagine you're being, you're being absent because you're sick, absences due to suspensions, and then you layer on a teacher being absent, no wonder we have such a gap in our outcomes. So again, here's a different look at the percentage of Minnesota, proficient, Minnesota students proficient in reading. And then the new, our newest immigrants, the Burmese, they're at the bottom here. So we really need to think about what we're doing for our students. So you may ask, how long would it take for students to succeed? Minnesota black students won't meet white students in reading standards to 2102. 
And Latinx students want me white students to read stamps to 2073. I'm like, 2073? Is there a 2073? I probably won't be around, but I'm hoping that things will be changed. And Minnesota students of color won't meet white students in math because there has been no growth. So it's indeterminate. And so if you look at the first one, black students, that's 81 years. And for the Latin students, that's 53 years until they get to proficiency. And of course, the gauge keeps changing. So that's a challenge for us. How do we measure up across the country? Fourth grade reading, you know, the NAEP scores um, that we, the NAEP, the NAEP assessment that we all do, the fourth grade reading, black students ranked 43rd out of 48. Asian students 20 out of 32. In the high school graduation, black students ranked 51st and Latin students 51st in the country for graduating, 51st percent. The number of Minnesota students that don't graduate on time is greater than the number of runners in the Twin City Marathon every year. So that gives you an idea of how. So I'm here today to ask you to change the story, rewrite the ending, decide today that our BIPOC students are going to thrive. And I listed some references in the bibliography here, as well as resources. As I said, I'm now the chair of the Minnesota Educational Equity Partnership, Advancing in Equity and Excellence, the Catalyst, which does a lot with students and teachers in the classroom to set up expectations. And of course, I, I would be remiss of me if I didn't talk about the work that what's going on now with our students. They are in a situation where, of course, all of us are facing you know, mental distress about what's going on, but we cannot cannot think that kids can just go back to school and that's it. When kids come back to school, we have to be prepared to, to, to uh, accept them back in a way that they understand they come in an environment that welcomes them. And the other thing that I will say that I didn't say in the first uh, part of the presentation is the fact that I want to tell if you want to contact me is the fact that at the university where I work, Minnesota State Mankato, we actually spend a lot of time in the ed leadership department where we have masters, specialists, where people want to be licensed principals or superintendents and the doctorate program. We spend a lot of time making sure that we bring race intentionally into the classroom. And we'd like to say we're unapologetic about talking about race because we know what happens and we understand because a lot of us who are teaching there have been superintendents. We understand the need for superintendents to be aware of their surroundings and the communities they serve, not in a way that they dismiss what's going on, but in a way that they that when they see George Floyd killing, murder, and you see things happen in the community that you're teaching and you are able to talk about them in ways that help students feel like they don't have to feel a sense of uh, concern or shame, but especially understand that they're in an environment that understands how they may feel about what's going on. And so the strategies that we use, I'm going back here, that we use, quite frankly, we, I use these strategies uh, in my work. Um, we, we brought in mental health uh, support into schools, but I'm gonna make sure that I'm clear because I had uh, a union president stand up and say that she went to a school and the psychiatrist said that all the kids were mentally ill. Now, usually you don't speak back from the dais, but I had to, and I had to say to her, I'm sorry, I, I reject that assumption. And I think it's malpractice for a psychiatrist to make an assessment of people that he, had, he or she has not had an opportunity to work with. And I'm trying to look at my time here, though I'm sure I'm going to go over, but I just wanted to make sure I covered that with you. And I wanna thank, uh, I said again, Dr. Jones for her presentation was very illuminating. And I hope you brought that prior knowledge to this presentation. I also await your questions for this presentation. Thank you, Dr. Johnson, for joining us today. And I know that everyone has really limited time, but you made some very important points. And I think in terms of thinking about how the disparities so often live in the discretion that is given um, in terms of how we uh, approach things and also the work that you did around making those intersectional links as well between not only race, but disability, because we know our students with disabilities are also experiencing some significant uh, disparities and uplifting the challenges that we have to really uh, break down that school to prison uh, pipeline um, is another uh, uh, key piece that 
you uh, brought forward today and the data. Um, no matter how many times I see this data, it is so stark when we think about the fact that indigenous students make up 1.6% of our student population, but are 10 times more likely to be suspended. That yeah. tells you a lot within, uh, with, within that data. Um, so we will, we will now uh, move on to our, our last uh, speaker, uh, Mary Frances uh, Clarity. Um, uh, Ms. Frances Clarity uh, is a teacher at St. Paul uh, Public Schools and is also a board member with Inver Grove Heights uh, School Board. So the floor is now yours um, and please uh, introduce yourself for the record and feel free to share your screen. Well, thank you, Chair Richardson, and thanks for inviting me to speak today. Um, I am Mary Frances Clardy, and I live in the legislative uh, district of 52B. So I've been teaching for St. Paul schools for 24 years. And um, I, first of all, I, I want to congratulate the Education Policy Committee for um, its focus on today on addressing racial disparities in education. Unfortunately, it's not a new issue, but instead um, represents an ongoing legacy that has limited potential and countless students across the nation and the state. So in, in um, effort to eradicate the inequities in education, May 17th, 1954, the Supreme Court um, ruled in Brown versus education that racial segregation in public schools was unconstitutional. So despite this historic ruling 67 years ago, we find the ranks of teachers today in Maine are still worse, um, still segregated, or at best are underrepresented by teachers of um, color or American Indians. So um, how did we get here? Well, Madeline Will May suggested in her article, 65 years after Brown v. Board, who are all the black educators, which was published in the Educational Week, May 19th, or sorry, May 14th, 2019. Unfortunately, Brown also had some unintended consequences. It caused dismissals, demotions, forced resignations, and many experienced high, um, many very experienced and high credentialed black educators who were staffed by black only schools have left the field. After the decision, um, tens of thousands of black educators and principals lost their job. And um, this loss of talent has never been fully offset. So prior to Brown in, um, prior to Brown in 17 states that had segregated school systems, 35 to 50% of the teaching force was black. Um, between 1984 and 1984, 89, about 21,500 black teachers were displaced because of new requirements for teaching education programs and certifications. In 1921, it's imperative that the legislature, the legislature acts to pass um, bills so that we can ensure that Minnesota um, schools experience is not one in which students are underserved disregarded, ostracized, harassed, or sidelines because of not having a diverse teaching workforce. Representation matters and narratives matter, whether they're spoken or whether they're not visible. Um, as a child growing up in Minnesota public schools, I would have loved to have a teacher or you know, a teacher leader of color, but unfortunately I had to wait until I attended university down in Mankato before I came across my first educator of color with the exception of my Spanish teacher. So tragically in 2021, not much has changed since I was a little girl in school. So the second point I wanted to make is the importance of uh, the collaborative educator program. Um, I entered a teaching prep program about 24 years ago and it was specifically dedicated to diversify the teaching force. And at the time I entered, I already had a bachelor's degree. I was employed at Habitat for Humanity as a program manager, making a good salary. I owned my own house and I had a car. I was paying for debt, daycare for my daughter. 
And um, in order for me to be able to do teaching as a second career, the conditions had to be right. So um, they had to be, so they had to be in a position where I wouldn't harm my family by changing careers. So without my, um, or without um, running into this opportunity, this would have never happened. Um, namely because of economic barriers. And that is what I feel is keeping a lot of people out of teaching because it's expensive to go to university. And um, with me, I would have to forego a salary and take out a student loan to accomplish this. So when I entered the program, um, some of the benefits that offset the economic barriers were I had a paid stipend um, and it was $18,000 a year. And at that time, it was pretty good, but that was 24 years ago. All my college fees and books and tuitions were paid for. I was guaranteed employment um, with the school district upon successful completion. The, there was a professional tutoring lab, which um, was offered at no fee for professional standards test um, prep. And that's the equivalent of the MTLE today. And this was essential. This was an essential piece because it helped um, offset the perceived cultural bias contained within the test while increasing testing proficiency. Um, it also offered competitive salaries um, that were negotiated in advance. So new teachers that left their professional fields did not have to start at the bottom of the scale. And I can tell you in my class, besides having several managers, there are people that were in the science fields and um, other industries that had competitive salaries. So this was a big plus. Um, some of the technical pieces that were important is that the internship started in September, which like, was like the startup of the school year um, and it lasted through spring. So the, the um, residency piece was longer. It partnered a novice teacher with a seasoned teacher um, and it had provisions where the, or the classes were in the evenings. Um, and we also received ongoing feedback, formal and informal evaluations from our teacher. Um, so it was set up just like an apprentice program. And then there was also standard regular student teacher evaluations that were given to any other student that might've gone on a, a student teaching program. So this um, cohort was a group of um, students that were of color. So it was nice to have that affinity group. So perhaps the most important um, point that I can make today is that research shows that having a teacher of color increases outcomes for all students, especially teachers or especially students of color. And when they have a diverse set of of well-prepared teachers in front of the classroom, but they will exceed expectations. Um, today in our urban public schools, approximately four or five teachers, I'm sorry, approximately four out of five teachers identify as white, while more than 50% of our students are of color. We have an increasingly large gap between the diversity of our teachers' workforce and the diversity of the student population. With this left unchecked, which if left unchecked, um, will diminish the learning experience for all students, limit the potential and have a well-rounded educational experience. Representation does matter. And uh, Chair Richardson and members of the committee Thank you for hearing my testimony today. Thank you, um, uh, Ms. Hardy, for uh, presenting today and, and sharing information related to the historical uh, legacy of, of push out of, of, of Black teachers and um, uh, Black uh, administrators um, as well and to talk about the successes that can be uh, possible as well with, um, with support. So 
uh, definitely appreciate that. And uh, just want to uplift your, st your statement that the research shows that when there is a diverse teaching pool, all students uh, do better as a result of that. So thank you for bringing that forward. So with that, we will uh, begin to um, go through uh, questions. And uh, first up on the list, I have Representative Edelson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I wanna just thank the, the testifiers today. Um, all of you are amazing. I've seen uh, Dr. Johnson, I've seen you testify in education finance last year. Your presentation is always powerful. Uh, we really do have to do something about uh, the discipline disparities that we have in Minnesota. Um, Dr. Jones, can I just say, wow, <laughs> like you're so, you're, you, um, you are on fire. I mean, you're so passionate and you clearly know a lot about this and care a lot about this issue. Um, and, you know, so I, I grew up uh, in, in a 90% black community. And so I, I always say when I was 12, like from birth to 12, I only had black friends. And so, um, but I real and now I represent Edina, which is primarily white. And so I have a very different view than many Minnesotans when it comes to race. And I think it's, it's what you say is very powerful. When I think about institutional racism, um, how do we, how do we change it though? I mean, so, right, we, we, we talk about it. And I think about where we were and where we have been. Um, and now where, where do we need to be? And how do we get there? How do we change hearts and minds? Because in our community, like it, not only mine, but across Minnesota where it's very white, um, people that maybe do not know black people, like I have a, a neighbor that said, well, how do I deal with racism when I don't even have, I don't know anyone that's black. I don't, so, I mean, those are honest conversations that I think that we're gonna have to have. Um, and I just, I mean, I'm kind of curious what your thoughts are when, you know, if people don't, because media and, you know, books and we have all this history, how do we take all of that and use it as power versus something, you know, that people are ashamed about or that they don't, I love your analogies too, of like, they just don't know that that door is closed for others because people don't know that like the neighborhood I live in was redlined and I'm Jewish and like Jews were like, it's on my deed, Jews, you couldn't live here. Like I was telling my sons that the country club, I couldn't, we couldn't go to that country club in the eighties. There was like no Jews, no blacks. So like, what, what do you think? How do we actually do this? So I have two, I have two answers to it kind of more, uh, um, how we do it as groups and then within ourselves. Um, and actually this is ongoing work that I'm working with with the collective. So I think the first thing is to actually um, do what I call shine the bright light of inquiry. I said, look for evidence of two-sided signs. Uh, Superintendent Johnson talked about it as, you know, looking at the data. So, so, so every month, right, look at the suspension data, whatever, we have to actually see is there something differential going on in our sphere of work or our, our neighborhood or whatever, be unafraid to actually shine that bright light of inquiry. So we have to do that. We can't assume that everything is okay just because it looks okay from our side. We have to understand that two-sided sides are operating all throughout our society. Then once we find a problem that we're ready to dig into, and there, there are lots of problems and that's why one person can't take on all of it. And it's not like, what can I do about racism? It's better, what can we do about racism? This narrow focus on the individual sometimes makes us feel paralyzed that it's too big a problem. I'm just gonna read my book or whatever, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, so, but then once we have a, a problem, once we've been brave enough to see the problem, we need to ask, why is this? So, but I think of it as serial wise. So you, you might say, well, why are these people being suspended differentially. Well, maybe it's uh, because the teacher didn't really understand or had a different assumption. Well, why did the teacher have a different assumption? Well, it's because of who the teachers are and we don't have teachers who really from those neighborhoods or, or, or feel that those are their children. So why, so why is that? And you just keep getting back at serial wise until you get, first of all, to root causes because when you start asking serial wise, you will immediately get beyond the individual to the context. And then when you ask why again, you'll get beyond the context to, to why do we see this context? Because the context in which we find ourselves are not accidentally evenly distributed, right ever, but we have to go there and you will find ways that you can intervene. 
So let's put a pin in that. The third step is after, you, um, after you've done the serial whys, then you have to address inaction in the face of need. So now, so now you have the need, you have identified the need, but then people might be, so that addressing inaction in the face of need, how do you know what to do? How will I guide my action so that I'm anti-racism? And I don't say anti-racist because people get confused and all, oh, are you against me as a person? No, racism, we are anti-racism, we're against the system, right? And so I have three, well, the three principles that I shared with you for achieving health equity are value all individuals and populations equally. How do you operationalize that? I'll just say a second about that after I get the other two, but recognize and rectify historical injustices and provide resources according to need. How do you operationalize valuing all individuals and populations equally? Well, think about the things that you value and what you do for them. So you value your children, so you protect them, you nurture them, you elevate them, you listen to them, you uh, provide resources, you, you know, it's all of the things we could, in, among us, we could have a hundred valuing words. We'll do that for all, right? A big way is to invite voice. It's investing in communities for people who are already trying to solve the problems in those communities, bringing their voices to table. So that's kind of the big macro way. But even in the small individual things, value all individuals and populations equally. I mean, we are so we are so off on that in this country that we don't even recognize it. Um, we're so off on that that Black people looked at the Janu January 6th insurrection and knew that if those had been Black, Brown, or Indigenous people, we'd all be dead. They would be dead. They wouldn't be up in there with a the police officer standing there while somebody's lounging and somebody's... No, right? We don't even understand it. I'm going off a little bit, but the 22-year-old who stole Nancy Pelosi's laptop was remanded to her mother's custody. She was going to sell that to the Russians. And yet a 16-year-old man, I just learned about him, a boy, a 16-year-old boy who who stole a backpack, this is some years ago, was because his parents couldn't afford bail, was sent to Rikers Island where he stayed for three years awaiting trial and then his court case was dismissed. And then one day something else happened, you know, just in the world and he said, I can't take it anymore and he committed suicide. But this is, so he knew that something different and, but other people don't know. So anyway, so we need to value all of us equally, right? White supremacist ideology that underlies a lot of this stuff subtly, people wouldn't go around saying I'm a white supremacist ideologist, but it subtly has devalued black life and other people's lives and our potentials. They're surprised at, at our competence. They're, you know, benefit of the doubt is a way that white privilege works and surprise and competence on the other side. So anyway, so you value that way. And Dr. Mm -hmm. Jones, I'm so sorry that I'm going to have to cut you off here. I know, have, I know. I did, okay. We, we have just six minutes okay. left, three questions. Okay. So um, uh, Representative uh, Keeler, you're up next. Thank you, Madam Chair. My question um, is for Dr. Johnson. I really appreciate the work that you've done and your conversation around um, suspensions. You talked a lot about the data on who is being suspended. I'm wondering if you have any data that you dig into, like who is doing the suspending? Because one of the things I would really like to look at is that, um, you know, the which teachers are doing this more? Are there certain topics? Is it math? Are we seeing more suspensions happen in math because maybe our students are struggling there a little bit more? Does it happen to be teachers that are tenured and have been in the system for 20 years? Um, you know, so that we can kind of build an idea of who is suspending our underserved populations more so we can get to the root of how do we manage that from a policy standpoint? Dr. Johnson, could you do about 45 seconds? We got two per questions. At a high level and quickly, I did not drill down to people's uh, tenure. I can say that 85% of our teacher core was white. And so I would say as a white teacher, uh, I would say that the majority of teachers that served our students at high poverty schools were probationary and new teachers. And then I forgot to say one thing about the video, when I was showing the guy with the three, my grandson, I was asked by someone when I showed them that presentation where my grandson and my son in a game. So seeing them do it, and now I, I never looked it up, but they, he was doing three, my son was doing 33. 
So the question to me was, are they in a gang? And I'm like, really? My three-year-old grandson in a gang? It, it, let, it seriously goes back to what Dr. Jones was. I went back to my son. I said, please tell me you're not in a gang. He said, mom, what are you talking about? So I'm just saying, that's the kind of crazy stuff that happens. And I would say one more thing that happened that I thought was really crazy, but I got a letter from the Federal Civil Rights Commission when I did this and saying that I needed to cease and desist. It's a, a bipartisan group of leaders appointed, I think by George Bush. I'm looking at Representative Frazier there because he worked, he was my lawyer. And they wrote, seriously wrote me a letter, told me to stop. I'm like, the hell I will. I mean, so they said I was breaking the constitution and all these things, which is scare some people, but I was not, I mean, I had had a backbone of steel by this time and I was too courageous to, to let that intimidate me. If you Google it, you'll see it. So yeah, so it really is probably more the people. So what it means that the universities have to do a better job of their development of teachers. Sorry, Representative Keeler. Thank, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Johnson. And so um, next we're going to go to Representative uh, Erdahl and then we'll have Representative Frazier close us out. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And, and just uh, uh, pointing out uh, to Dr. Jones that uh, in Minnesota, we do not fund schools uh, based on, on property values. So we're a little bit... Uh, Ahead of that. I think in better shape here with that. Uh, and then just a, a quick question, of, uh, it's Ms. Clarity, was that the name? Uh, would you uh, expound a little bit on the importance of, of mentorship, uh, of a mentorship program uh, for, uh, for minority teachers, uh, teachers of color, uh, and you know, any teacher for that matter? Thank you. I, you know what? Ms. Clarity. I, I'm sorry. Uh, Thank you, uh, <laughs> Chair uh, Richardson and, and uh, Representative Erdahl. <laughs> um, I, I just think apprenticeship is crucial in every profession because if you think about it, if you compare teaching to other professions like you know maybe a doctor or even like a, a mechanic or something, that that piece cannot be surpassed. It, you know there are a lot of things that are in text. But when you're really experiencing it and getting direct feedback on the specific item, that's what's crucial and that's what's gonna propel you forward. So it's crucial for all teachers. And it's, I think it's a, maybe one of those aspects that needs to be looked at in all teaching programs, but definitely within a teacher program for color or for uh, teachers of color. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Clarity. Uh, any follow-up representative or at all? Uh, no, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Representative Frazier. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And I'll, I'll try to be quick. We got about three minutes. Uh, Dr. Dr. Jones, Dr. Johnson, and, and Board Member Clarity, thank you all for presenting today. I think it was, it was powerful. I think it was informative um, and very insightful. You know, uh, Dr. Jones in particular, you, um, you, your presentation reminded me of my elementary school teachers and how enthusiastic they were and, and how they kept our attention. But also, I think I was fortunate because I grew up in a, uh, in a community where 99% of my teachers looked like me. They understood where I came from. They also understood what it was gonna take for me to be successful as a black man in this world. And once I left that community, and, and that has been uh, very beneficial to me as I, as I moved through life and as I moved through my professional career. Um, Dr. Johnson, I, I do remember I remember when you put that policy in place and I remember the pushback and the controversy around it. I think it was the right thing then. I think it should be the right thing now. Um, the data bared out and it showed that. I know the question came up to what, what teachers were the ones that were doing that. But, but the biggest piece was looking at, because of the discretion, the reasons why those students were being suspended and, and how different uh, students were being treated versus what their race was. And that was a big piece. Just, just to close out, I'll say that it's imperative that us as legislators have the, the want and the will to start putting policies in place that are going to close these opportunity and achievement gaps. Everything that was talked about today and everything we're going to discuss in this committee, we are looking at a dire situation in future for our state if we don't take these actions. That's, there's, there's nothing else that can be said other than that. Um, we, are, are, we are a state that is based it on building a great foundation around education, and we have to make sure that we continue to do that um, and particularly to take care of the students that are falling in these disparity gaps. Uh, we, 
we will affect that short term. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Frazier, for your, um, your, your closing comments. And uh, we are unfortunately at time um, and we will approve um, uh, meeting minutes next uh, meeting and we'll be able to continue this conversation next Monday with uh, public testimony as well. Uh, with that, there is no further business uh, before the committee. Uh, have a good afternoon, everyone. We're adjourned.